咲くやこの花冬ごもり今を春べと咲くやこの花今を春べと咲くやこの花 The flower bloomed two years ago in the beginning of March. An internet friend of mine who I met through TikTok had been raving about an anime series I had never heard of before. It had to do with something about card games, which I never really was into, so I put off watching it, despite my friend never missing when it came to giving recommendations for great series. However, there was one day where I had nothing better to do, so I thought, what better way to pass the time than sit on the couch with a bowl of popcorn and check out the show that my friend loved. Some show called Chihaya Furu that I had yet to know would consume my every waking thought for the next two years. As I watched the first three episodes, I think I knew how much the series would take over my entire life. Within a month of starting it, I had already watched all three seasons through copious amounts of tears. Chihaya Furu, the anime, struck a huge chord inside of me. But if you're a fan of this series, then you know season three leaves off on a cliffhanger. I could not sit around and not know what happened next. So I found this series online and got to reading. What I didn't know was that somehow the anime was only the tip of the Chihaya Furu iceberg. The manga itself was even more of a visionary and storytelling masterpiece than I could have ever imagined it to be. I was all in on Chihaya Furu and there was no going back. With any amazing series though, there will always be an end in sight. That ending for Chihaya Furu came in August 2022. With 247 chapters and 50 volumes in total. An ending that not only had me shaking and crying in a mixture of happiness and sadness, but also laying on the floor contemplating why it felt like my life was over. One of the most important and profound series I have ever read was now completed. I wasn't quite sure what to do next until it hit me. Read it. Read it all over again. And then talk about the series. Get others connected to the story and characters, just like my friend did for me when the flower first bloomed. Now, while I want nothing more than to just talk about my love for Chihaya Furu, I know how the internet is and I know how people felt about the ending of the manga. You can feel how you want about it. You can be mad, upset, and frustrated. But this video is not the place to vent those feelings. This video essay is my magnum opus to one of my favorite pieces of media of all time. And a comment that you leave about how much you hate the series now and that it sucks is just not welcome. I know that feeling so emotionally attached to a piece of media is not super healthy. I know that me feeling upset about people hating something that I love may seem stupid. This video is about the amazing writing, characters, story, and emotion that were put into Chihaya Furu. And how I connected with them so deeply. It is not a video for people to just put down this series because a ship they didn't like won in the end. One more disclaimer is that obviously this video will cover the manga from beginning to end. There will be spoilers for the whole series. Please do not continue watching this video if you are anime only and holding out for a season four like me, or if you are just keeping up with the Kodansha digital releases. Connection is what drives everything in Chihaya Furu. It's what makes this series so impactful. Every facet of the story connects to each other in some way. From the direct swipe of a card, to the text printed on it, to the people who got a character to that moment. Which is why the series is laced with nuance and unspoken dialogue. Connections are not always talked about directly. But we can see them clear as day in Chihaya Furu. Each connection stemming from Chihaya's passion and love for the sport of karata. When we start the series, we meet a young girl named Chihaya Ayase, who's a bit of a tomboyish loudmouth. She has neither passion or hobbies, but she does have a lot of love for her big sister, Chitose. While she doesn't have dreams for herself, she wants nothing more than to see her sister become a successful model. Her dream is her sister's dream. 
She never thought that she could love something just as much as her. However, one day she meets the quiet transfer kid at school, Wataya Arata, who introduces her to the sport of karata, a card game using the Hyakunin Ishu, or 100 Poets, to compete in a battle of memorization, hearing, and speed. A game in which Chihaya quickly finds out the incredible skill Arata has when playing. While at first overwhelmed, Chihaya is amazed by Arata, but she finds herself getting just as passionate when she plays him in a match. The fervor of the game between them leads to Chihaya being able to take one card from Arata, the Say card something she worked hard for and managed to capture for herself with her own excitement in mind. Arata then bestows upon her a card of her own namesake, Chihaya Furu, a card she worked hard for and a card she was given. At this point, there is no going back as Chihaya is immersed in playing Karata. Feeling left out of the conversations between Arata and Chihaya is her childhood friend, Taichi Mashima. He's jealous that Chihaya isn't talking to him the most anymore, and in that way that young kids like to, picks on her to get her to pay attention. Taichi even gets more upset when she tells him that Arata could beat him in their school's Karata tournament. Under the pressure of his mom to win the final match, Taichi takes Arata's glasses in a last-ditch effort to snag victory. Although, when Shihaya sees Arata getting upset because he can't play Karata how he likes, she takes his place beating Taichi in the game, grabbing herself the Chihaya Furu card and telling Taichi how much fun she had playing against him. It takes until the next day for Taichi to return Arata's glasses to him, as he's upset that Arata may tell Chihaya what he did. Arata remembers what Chihaya has told him about his mother putting pressure on him to not lose, and tells him that he's a coward, but he understands. The three kids end up befriending one another and joining a karata society together, each starting their own karata journey in their own individual ways while still playing as a team. Team Chihaya Furu. A team of Chihaya, Arata, and Taichi where they all want to win together, but also at the same time, they want to beat each other. One of competition, but also one of passion. The time in their lives when the seed was first planted, but not yet fully bloomed. This can't last forever though, as Arata must move back to his rural town to live with his grandpa, who was once a former Karata Majin. He's become sick, and Arata's family must take care of him. As a last hurrah for Team Chihaya Furu, Chihaya and Arata play one more match in that tiny apartment building with Taichi as the reader. The three make a promise that as long as they continue to play Karata, they can all meet again. This isn't going to entirely be goodbye, as as long as they keep playing Karata, they can meet in tournaments over and over and over. They'll never stay lonely as long as they have the game with them. Unfortunately for Chihaya, by the time she enters her first year at Mizusawa, she hasn't heard from Arata since he moved or seen Taichi since he stopped coming to the Karata Society in middle school. Chihaya has been trying to start a new Karata club at school, but no one has asked to join since she's been putting up flyers. It seems that she'll continue on the path of playing Karata alone and without her friends. She's flopped on the grass of the school grounds listening to the Hyakunin issue when the Tare poem plays. A poem about the loneliness you feel when you're apart from those you care for. When suddenly, Taichi appears over her for the first time in a while, and she finally feels that ray of hope once more. The beginning of the story lays the groundwork for the entirety of Chihaya Furu. Skipping over the first three volumes that set up the main three characters' story arcs would be completely missing out on every beginning aspect of them. You can't understand Chihaya without seeing where she first started before learning about Karata. You can't understand Taichi without seeing how he was pressured in his childhood. The only one you could kind of understand without these first volumes would be Arata, but even then you couldn't even imagine why his drastic change is so heartbreaking. The character's worries, insecurities, loneliness, and passion all begin in their childhood days. There's an unshakable connection between these three characters from that moment on in this series. To completely understand how each shaped the other so deeply, we need to take a look at where they first started. Firstly, we'll look at Chihaya, who is 
our main, main character of the three. She seems like on the surface, she's a happy-go-lucky girl with head empty, no thoughts, which she kind of is. But when you look past the surface, there's a lot more complex emotions behind her. Specifically, there are three important characterizations that define her development throughout the early parts of the series. These three being her insecurity about her personality, her isolation from other people, and her inferiority complex in her family. All three of these are pivotal in the manga and emphasize much more so than in the anime. Chihaya is extremely insecure about her inability to think before she speaks. Words will just come out of her mouth before she understands that those same words may harm someone that she doesn't mean to. This makes her feel stupid and resentful of her own behavior. Not only does she have a hard time speaking, but she also has a hard time understanding others' feelings as well. When someone is frustrated or overwhelmed by Chihaya's passion for Karuta, she doesn't often notice until it's too late. She is trying to make sure that her intentions are always understood, but usually ends up saying the first thing on her mind without considering the other person. This insecurity is where we see her fear that she'll end up lonely again. This fear of loneliness stems from her time post Aruta and pre Taichi. She knows the joys of playing Karuta with her friends, but those joys were cut short and haven't returned since. The kids her age and her car to society have been able to join school teams or moved on. However, Chihaya can't. She can't find anyone who will play with her and no one to join a team to compete with her. There's several panels of Chihaya during this time on the empty tatami with no one else around her. She knows how it feels to have friends who share her interest, so to not have friends who share that interest just makes her that much more isolated. She tries fitting in, but she can't think of anything other than Karata in her life. This love of Karata leads to her inferiority complex in her family. For much of her life, everything revolved around her sister and her sister's dreams. Now that Chihaya has her own passion, she thinks that her family will support her just like they do her sister but none of them really even get what Karuta is. Chitose even tells her to give up on it and that it's worthless. Understandably, Chihaya doesn't get how her sister can't just be as supportive as she was towards her. It doesn't help that even her mom brushes her interest aside since she's so focused on helping Chitose achieve her goals, especially now that she's gotten busier. Chihaya is feeling lonely at home, at school, and even when playing Karata. Despite all this though, having Karata makes her feel less alone. Chihaya knows that Karata can bring new people into her life, bring new passions and joys and loves. She experienced this firsthand for one beautiful moment years ago. One of the first things she finds out about the sport of Karata when she meets her teacher, Harada, is that learning the Hyaknin issue is like making 100 friends. She can not only make friends with the cards, but with other people as well. The reason she came to love Karata is because of that strong connection she felt when she first played. The connection to the first thing she ever felt a wealth of drive and passion for completely her own. While she found that passion on her own, she never would have discovered it without that boy from Fukui, Arata. When Arata is introduced as a child, he already has a leg up on Chihaya and Taichi on the talent end of things. He's been playing Karata for years due to his grandpa having been a Karata Majin. Already spending his time honing his skills and aiming to be a Karata Majin himself one day. More so, one of his defining traits before the trio splits up is that he doesn't hold back on anyone he plays against. He would crush a newbie and he wouldn't bat an eye doing so. This is what really made Chihaya try her hardest when playing against him in that first game though. Without Arata's overwhelming talent and inability to hold himself back, Chihaya may never have been struck by that same force of energy. Which is why when we've reached the high school era of Chihaya Furu, we become increasingly devastated by what has happened to Arata. When we meet Arata a second time after Chihaya and Taichi have reunited in high school, he is broken down, just a shell of his former self that the two knew when they were kids. Chihaya excitedly calls Arata for the first time after getting class A in a tournament 
only to find out that he no longer plays. In fact, he tells her never to call him again. Shocked and incredulous by this discovery, the two board a train the next day to go visit him. She can't let go of the fact that the boy who taught her about what passion was has quit the interest that connected them. What they come to realize is that Arta lost his grandpa, the person in his life that taught him what passion and dreams were. This is where Arata's development stems from for the rest of the series. He's lost the drive for something he once loved because he lost the person who gave him that drive. He finds no meaning to playing Karta if he doesn't have his grandpa with him to teach him and nurture him like he once did. On top of this, he also had to witness his grandpa lose his memories as he had dementia. The person who connected him to this wonderful game was losing that connection before his very eyes and he couldn't do a single thing about it. He's losing everything all at once. The real kick to put Arata down was that his grandpa passed away when Arata was out playing Karata. Even if his grandpa told Arata to go play in that tournament during a moment of healthiness, Arata still left him. Arata left him all alone and he could not forgive himself for choosing Karata over his grandpa. He doesn't think he deserves to play the game as happily as he once did. Karata has become scary to him. It's become something that reminds him of his grandpa's declining health and eventual death. Chihaya thinks of Arata as her Karata god, but in Arata's mind, that's his grandpa. He doesn't know if he can come back from losing his own Karata god. However, he can't think like this forever. He can't avoid his grandpa's death and never move forward. So when he sees Taichi and Shihaya playing in a Karata match on a team together, he remembers how fun Karata is. He realizes that he needs to forgive himself, that his grandpa would never have wanted him to quit Karata for his sake. But dealing with that grief of losing someone so dear to him will never be an instant fix. The rest of the series, he has to work on how to grieve his grandpa properly, while also paying his respects to him in the form of Karata. Arata learned everything he knew from him, so he can continue their connection by playing how he was taught. While Arata gave Chihaya that passion for Karata, she would have never gone further than where she was starting high school if it wasn't for reuniting with Taichi. He's the reason she was able to build the support system and experience she needed up to the end of the series. Had it not been for Taichi meeting her that day on the grassy school grounds, Shihaya may have been playing Karata alone forever. The two of them started the Mizusawa Karata team together trained together, went through hardships together, and victories together. The one who learned how to help keep her emotions in check during matches and pull her back from her anxiety. He does all this in spite of his own very deep-set insecurities because of his love for those he cares for. Taichi's original sin in this series is that of taking Arata's glasses in the school Karata tournament. I call it the original sin because many readers refuse to let him live this down for the entirety of the series. It's something that Taichi himself doesn't even feel he could ever live down. Even if Arata understands why Taichi did it, and even if we understand that Taichi is deeply remorseful for his cowardice, his character arc and development come comes from his acknowledgement of his own cowardly actions. He's always been pressured by his mother to only do things that he's good at, and if he can't be the best, to quit. This line of thinking has made him scared to ever put serious effort into something. What if he ends up loving it so much but isn't good at what he loves? This idea scares him away from going after something too hard. During Chihaya's Class A tournament, Taichi comes to watch her play Karata for the first time in years. She forced him to promise her that if she wins the tournament and moves to Class A, he'll have to form a Karata team with her at school. Taichi is of course reluctant about this because he wanted to put Karata in his past. When he sees her playing though, he can feel that spark reigniting inside of him. However, he also feels that dread of what comes next. He feels that shadow of Arata's immense skill looming over him and that insecurity that he'll never be good enough. These same feelings he had back when he first took Arata's glasses. Although his original sin makes Taichi realize his own cowardice, what helps him strive to move past this weakness is the words of Harada, a curse that was then placed over him for the rest of the series. Even if you practice for your entire life, you'll never get stronger. Eyelashes, 
only say that after you've tried. This is how Tai Chi approaches everything he desires for the rest of the series. He can't give up on anything he wants, even if it's destroying him inside. Because if he doesn't try, then what does that say about him? He no longer wants to run away from putting 100% of his effort into Karata. He no longer wants to run away from facing Arata fair and square. He no longer wants to run away from his feelings for Chihaya. While this is admirable, he doesn't know how to rely on others, as he's so used to letting himself be the one to be relied on. So he ends up burning himself out mentally, especially since he's already struggling with his own constant self comparisons to his friends, then feeling resentful that he got jealous over someone he cares for doing better. His character is full of contradictions and self-loathing. These contradictions often lead people to misrepresent Tai Chi's character throughout. He's caring, but he's petty. He loves Karata, but he hates it. He wants Arata to return, but he also wants him to stay away. All these contradictions just makes Tai Chi's resolve to overcome his cowardice that much more commendable. He wants to be someone that Arata can accept as a worthy opponent, someone that Chihaya can look at while playing and see as an adversary. He wants to be taken seriously by his two friends who love Karata so dearly, otherwise he might get left behind losing that connection to them. Tai Chi's slow growth throughout the series is one of triumphs and setbacks. Tai Chi is Chihaya's emotional core despite his own emotions being a bottomless pit at times. He's always there when she's at her lowest lows and knows what she needs when she's there. Whether it's unclenching her fists, pinching her cheeks, or telling her that all she needs to win is just breathe. Sentiments that carry through the series during many of Chihaya's Karata matches. Reminding herself to exhale deeply, just like Tai Chi gave her the peace of mind to do in their team games when he was the club president. With Tai Chi as her emotional core and Arata as her reason for passion, it may seem like Chihaya has no need for anything else in her life. Yet, Chihaya is greedy. She wants everything and more, which is why she isn't satisfied with merely just starting a team with Tai Chi, but she also wants to have an actual team to play cards and matches with. She remembers how fun it was to play on Team Chihaya Furu, and she wants that feeling back again. When she looks at the team she created at their first practice, she gets excited at the thought of her Karata world expanding, no longer being alone and giving back what she once received. What Chihaya had yet to realize is that there was still so much she could learn about the sport of Karata, so much to learn that the Mizusawa team can show her. Tai Chi is Chihaya's emotional core, but the Mizusawa Karata team is the heart of this series. Much of both Chihaya and Tai Chi's growth in Chihaya Furu happens over their three years with the Mizusawa Sawa Karata Club building their connections. Every new member introduced in the club over those years brought an important learning tool for them. Sutomu brings strategy to the team, Nishida brings technical skill, Sumire brings heart, Sukuba brings new perspectives, Namita brings athletic expertise, and Tamaru brings new challenges. Each member adds to the lessons learned and skills gained for the two of them. However, one member in particular serves the largest narrative purpose to connection in the series. The first member that Chihaya and Taichi add to the Mizusawa Karata team. Kanade Owe. Kana is Chihaya's original foil in the series, and whose importance to the overall message of connection can't be understated. Her biggest characteristic is that she loves traditional Japanese culture, especially kimono and hakama as her family runs a store selling them. Originally, Kana thinks of joining the club because she believes that she'll be able to play in traditional kimono. But seeing Chihaya and Tai Chi play so vigorously turns her away. She knows nothing about how to play the game anyway, but Chihaya presses her. Kana talks about the Karta cards in a way Chihaya has never thought about before, and this intrigues her. She learns that Kana knows the meaning of each of the poems and the vivid, rich histories behind them, something Chihaya never thought to look into. Kana is the perfect first addition to this series. She serves as a reminder that while karata is a sport, 
There's so much more to it than just that. There's a whole culture behind the poems that are being read. A meaning to every word recited while the players take their cards in a game. The first poem of which Chihaya learns a different meaning from Kana is, of course, the Chihaya Furu poem. A poem in which she thought was just about a beautiful river in the fall could actually be a poem about passionate love. One that must be concealed as the original poet was in love with the empress at the time. A deep red love that paints the card the text is printed on the same color in Chihaya's eyes now. Learning about the poems may seem obvious, but to a jock like Chihaya, she had never thought to think about the literature itself, which is why this makes Kana so important as a character. She adds the much needed nuance and context behind the emotions of this series, a very important aspect as well. I feel like I often see Chihaya Furu get pinned down as just a sports manga, which it definitely is, but it doesn't want to only be that. It wants to put emotions behind these characters that come outside of what they are striving for. Chihaya is a karata nut, but she's also a person with thoughts and feelings unrelated to karata. She often just uses karata as a vehicle to help her display those emotions correctly. Kana is a reminder that karata is still poetry that karata is still a song. Those songs put feelings into words and those feelings are just as important as the game itself. Chihaya Furu was just a poem of her namesake given to her before Kana gave it life. After which Chihaya is able to see the Chihaya Furu poem glowing a beautiful red whenever it's on the field. The poems themselves come to life for the rest of the series thanks to Kana, connecting us to the feelings of those over hundreds of years ago. Chihaya starts learning the meaning behind all of the cards and remembering their histories. Her karata gradually becoming more balanced because she's no longer ruled by just pure passion and talent alone. This connection to the poem's meanings is what makes every karata match from there on out laced with nuance. What may seem like simply winning a match becomes much more meaningful in the story of the series. The Chiha card comes to represent Chihaya herself as well as stability. It can be described as a spinning top, perfectly balanced, staying on a straight axis and never faltering. For Chihaya, the card is closer to represent the stability she feels when she's playing in her best form, a kind of karata that has no holes and can fire at all cylinders. Chihaya first thinks of this kind of karata as relating to Arata, but in reality, it's just her own aspiration of the kind of karata that she would like to play, one that she perceives as having no flaws or imperfections and can move with confidence. When it comes to the Chiha card for Arata and Taichi, it represents more instability than stability. Both boys have feelings for Chihaya that they don't fully understand. Feelings that Chihaya doesn't fully comprehend herself, whether it be giving or receiving. The relationship between the three after childhood has become uncertain and the perfectly spinning top often falters. Neither of them are really sure where their place in Chihaya's life fits anymore. Taichi feels that Arata's presence in Chihaya's heart is bigger as he's better at karata and she's often longing to meet him again. While Arata feels jealous that Taichi is able to always be by Chihaya's side as they started a team together. Each is jealous about the connection that the other has that they lack. For the two of them, the Chiha card is a manifestation of their feelings for Chihaya. For Taichi, the Chiha card is one he must claim under any circumstances. If he has his sights set on it, he has to get it no matter what. He's learned the offensive karta of the Shiranami society and knows that sometimes fate has to be willed. If he does send the Chiha card to an opponent, that doesn't mean he's given up. Just that he will do everything in his power to claim that card once more. The power to change his unlucky fate and create a new one through sheer willpower. During his match with Sudo, it's a card he so desperately wants that even the thought of it disappearing puts him in unease. This thought occurs to him at a time where he's trying to let go of any of his desires, 
but the Chiha card means too much. Allowing himself to let go of pride and hold on to that desperation that moves him. Arata, on the other hand, feels the need to give the Chiha card away in his matches. He doesn't want to be pulled into its gravitation and be swayed. He isn't interested in changing fates or forcing destiny. He'd rather move in one direction like a stream, to wherever his outcome leads him. When he gives up the Chiha card to Koshikawa in a match, it isn't to get it right back. He doesn't reach out for a future in which he's with Chihaya, as that's not how he operates. Avoiding the distractions around him and solely focusing on his own Karata to reach his goal. Arata's uncertainty comes from his playstyle diverging from his true feelings. And because of this, he can't play with that same greediness that Chihaya and Taichi have. These two are exact opposites of one another in playstyle, yet they are perfect parallels of each other as well. Their story arcs over the course of the series are ones of reigniting passion and perseverance through hardships, falling out of love and then falling back in love. Arata's arc happens early on in the series, where he realizes that while Karata is scary, he can't stay away from it. He comes back to Karata again through the passion that he sees in his friends. While Taichi's arc happens in a very similar way, where he leaves the club after confessing to Chihaya and must find his reason for passion again. Only coming back to Karata after seeing his two friends play each other for the first time since childhood. Both make promises to Chihaya after their return that they'll meet again in a match, proclaiming that as long as they have Karata, they'll always stay connected to each other. No longer hinging on the youthful dream of playing together that they once had, but a promise that they won't leave the car to world a second time. As with any love triangle though, this connection, like a spinning top, can also falter. Feelings are complicated and hard to navigate, especially when you don't have a grasp of your own desires like the three main characters. Arata and Taichi are friends, but they've always had a complicated relationship with one another, even before they realized their feelings for the same girl. But they let their jealousy get the best of them during times when they're feeling insecure. During the Yoshi tournament, Taichi leshes out at Arata after he finds out he's also starting his own team. He feels that his one connection to Chihaya that Arata isn't involved in will be lost, once again becoming insecure in his place in Chihaya's life as well as his own ability. In kind, Arata lashes out at Taichi when he's the one who gets to play Chihaya in the finals match. Not only is Arata upset because he lost his own match, being unable to play Chihaya because of this, but he's also mad that Taichi is the one to get to play her. He visualizes himself as the reader back in that apartment when he played Chihaya before leaving. This thought scares him as he feels his own connection to Chihaya is completely reliant on his Karata skill, later telling Taichi that Chihaya doesn't belong to either of them out of jealousy that Taichi got to play her. Romance in Chihaya Furu is hotly contested, but relationships are a hugely important factor in this series. We see how powerful love is for many characters throughout its entirety, which helps give us insight into the main romance between Chihaya and Taichi. Inokuma, who was a former Karata queen, wants to get back into Karata after having two kids, and her husband supports her every step of the way. She was inspired to play Karata because her two parents shared this passion together. There's also Sumiri Hanano, who loves the idea of love. This factor of her character is never put down by anyone else either. She finds a new passion for herself while still wanting to be in love, and we often get romantic perspectives through her. However, one of the biggest insights to the main romance is through Harada and his wife. After the final game, of the Majin match that Harada plays, he apologizes to his wife for losing once again. He's been defeated more times than he can count at this point, still being unable to make his dream of being the Majin come true at his old age. Even a little embarrassed of his failing knees and his lack of stamina, he thinks he's disappointed his wife for making her continue to watch him walk down this path. His wife tells him there's no need to apologize to her though. She doesn't even need him to win the Majin Asian match in her mind. All she wants is to see Harada smile. That's all she's ever wanted. So no matter how many times he loses an Amazian match or a regular match, 
she'll continue to support him. This is a direct parallel to several chapters later when Shihaya wishes the same thing for Taichi. She sees him struggling after his loss against Arata in their match. She sees him struggling on his own and being unable to rely on her. She can tell he's hurting, but she has no idea what she can do to help. The only thing she can think of is have a Valentine's Day party to help cheer him up. Thinking of how much he's struggling and suffering while she's enjoying her time with her friends crushes her, since she also wants to share in that same joy with him. While she prepares for the party with the other girls on the Mizusawa Kahurta team, she begins to cry, desperately wishing for Taichi to smile. That's all she wants is for him to smile once again. This is why Chihaya holds the Tai Chi Cup for his 18th birthday. She puts together an entire tournament just so Tai Chi can have fun with his friends and the game as well. The parallel between that small moment of deep red love between Harada and his wife can easily be connected to the unformed feelings Chihaya has for Taichi. A deep red love that she has yet to understand herself, much like how she has yet to fully understand what the Chiha card means to her. A card that glows deep red. A deep red reminiscent of the Omi Jingu Shrine where the queen and Majin matches are played. The shrine which moments before Chihaya competes for her dream of becoming the Karata Queen she sees Tai Chi. He's not actually there, but a vision of him. One that is smiling and wishing for her happiness. Under the Omi Shrine, a shrine the deep red color of the Chiha poem, a poem about longing for the one you love, Chihaya sees Tai Chi and Tai Chi sees her. The cards and their meanings are a part of Chihaya. They help her understand her own emotions and they help bring her closer to those around her. The connections to the cards is in mind, body, and soul. Karata isn't the only thing Chihaya loves anymore, but Karata also still helps her navigate her life and relationships. She's never been good at communicating with others. Still, the poems gave her the tools to do just that. They've given her a connection that she was so scared of losing in that first year of high school all alone. Towards the end of the series, Chihaya realizes that she doesn't want her connection to Karata to end with just forming the Mizusawa Club. She's greedier than that. She wants to continue connecting people to the game for as long as she can. Chihaya wants to spread the same love and passion to as many people as possible because it gives her so much joy. Which is why Chihaya decides she wants to become a teacher. She was always given the opportunity to grow her passions from her teachers and was inspired to do the same for others. Spreading that love of Karata is what Chihaya is all about. It's an equally important goal in her mind. She wants to achieve her dream of becoming the Karata Queen, but she also wants to continue forming connections through the game, all stemming from that initial desire to no longer be alone to no longer feel like someone else will never understand her. The fear of loneliness is what drives her to be so open and receptive to the feelings of others. She may not always say the right thing to someone, but she never wants them to feel like they're left out, including them in that sunlight that she radiates. This is why the two final bosses in Shihaya Furu are the antithesis to everything that Shihaya believes. The current Meijin, Suo Hisashi, and the current queen, Shinobu Wakamiya. Two people who have been isolated from the Karata world and have no connections to it. They are the exact opposite of Chihaya and challenge how she thinks about her own connections to the game. Loneliness and detachment plague their attitudes towards Karata, which scares her. Their game isn't the kind of game that she grew to love. So how can the two strongest players get to where they are with the complete opposite ideals. She fears that she will need to walk that exact same path if she wants to achieve her dream as well. Shinobu and Suo are more than meets the eye though. As both of them may seem unbeatable in Karata, their own emotions are rocky waves, each having immense hardships that they deal with alone. Their initial isolations from the Karata world was due to their childhood, 
but both continue to isolate themselves of their own volition further on, believing that no one else can help them grow and get stronger, using Karta to mask their own inner turmoils and insecurities. Starting with Shinobu, who is Chihaya's mirror in every sense of the literary term. Shinobu and Chihaya aren't very different from each other. Both were somewhat isolated kids who had a fear of loneliness. However, while Chihaya found Team Karta and a teacher who supported her, Shinobu found neither. Her own teacher told Shinobu that she could never play with kids her age because she was too good for them. She would play down to their level and the teacher knew that she could never get stronger in this way. In the end, isolating her from gaining any friendships and bonds in the long run. Thus making Shinobu believe that strength comes from isolation. Strength only comes from yourself. Her connection to Karta is purely to the cards and the poems. Shinobu has made 100 friends with the cards, just like Chihaya wanted to do. The entire strategy for her card placement and matches is based around how she feels a poet would like to be placed. She can't place one poet next to another because when they were alive, they hated each other. Her understanding of the cards runs so deep due to her isolation with them and them alone. Shinobu even admits to seeing them as tiny little gods that speak to her. A kind of connection that you can only get when you eat, sleep, and breathe Karata every day of every year. The dichotomy of individualism versus collectivism between Shinobu and Chihaya is what makes their rivalry so interesting. Shinobu believes Team Karata to be for weak players. It's what you do when you have no goals in Karata except for fooling around believing that any team players aren't actually interested in becoming Karata queens. Which is why Chihaya challenges this idea for her. Chihaya is just as interested in winning her team matches as she is beating Shinobu. She actively seeks to play her in matches. She even takes a card against her in the first match they ever played, as well as the Chiha card, challenging Shinobu's idea that team players can't be serious. In a lot of ways, Chihaya admires the way that Shinobu plays. She wants to attain that same power as her. Chihaya tries to connect to the cards in the same way that Shinobu does, as well as learning her techniques. Despite this, she still can't see Shinobu's side of things. She can't see Karta as an isolationist sport. Team Karta is just as important to her as any of her own individual matches. Even during individual matches, your team or your Karta society can help you get to the final match by wearing out other players along the way. It's still just as much of a team sport when you have people by your side who are supporting you. The strength of others can give you strength. Everything given to you comes from someone else. Shinobu has played alone with only the cards against her. There's a barrier to what you can learn when you only play by yourself over and over again. Chihaya has played with others. She's honed her skills by playing with her friends, playing with her rivals, through gaining new knowledge from her peers. She's collected all of these experiences by playing with a Karata team and joining a Karata society, both of which Shinobu actively avoids. She may see the cards as 100 friends, but Shihaya sees the cards as her 100 friends, the ones who've helped her learn and grow along the way. Shihaya wants Shinobu to see this too. She wants her to know that she understands the loneliness and isolation. She also knows how empty the Tatami feels when there's no one else around her. But but Chihaya wants to show that being at the top doesn't mean being alone. Showing her how fun Karata can be when there's even one more person there to challenge you. Karata doesn't have to be lonely. It doesn't have to be something that you play by yourself. It can be even more rewarding and challenging when your connections to the cards comes from your connections to others. Chihaya wants to give Shinobu a new and beautiful Karata world that they can share together. On the other end of the spectrum, we have Suo, who is completely detached to any sort of passion for the game of Karata. In fact, he's spiteful of the game. He uses the game against his own opponents who are passionate for the sport to try and break their spirits. He gets people to commit faults, make mistakes, and he's even able to match the card count to the games next to him, showing how much he can manipulate the game in his favor while also having a lack of care for what happens in his own match. Suo 
Luo is a ruthless and callous player who has no room to find love or connection to the sport. What we soon come to learn, though, is that Suo doesn't want to afford himself to have a passion, especially when that passion revolves heavily around the eyesight that he is slowly losing, a disease that is half hereditary in his family, which his guardian Yukiko also has, one that will eventually take his eyesight entirely and leave him unable to play Karata. So why would he let himself have passion for a game he'll soon lose? Might as well play half-heartedly and never get invested rather than get attached knowing you'll suffer later. Suo makes Chihaya question if passion is needed to become great. He makes her doubt if everything she tries so hard for is for nothing. Chihaya's entire life is filled with Karata, with how amazing and fun it is. It gives her immense joy and she sees the immense joy it gives others. Suo, on the other hand, just doesn't care, yet he's in the position that Shihaya would like to be in. The fact that he tries to actively crush people's dreams to put them on his level makes her despise him. It's one of the few times that we see Chihaya filled with anger or hatred towards someone else in the series. Shinobu may be the antagonist, but Suo is seen as the true villain. That is, at first, anyway. The one to bring Suo out of his villain role is actually Taichi. After Taichi leaves the Mizusawa Karuta Club, he ends up meeting Suo, and the two start to play together. Suo will constantly claim that he's not Taichi's mentor, but that's essentially what he is to him. Taichi learns his every move, his regimen, and his habits. He copies what he does for everything, down to the detachment from passion for the game, even having a small villain arc of his own where he antagonizes other players during matches. It takes Suo seeing someone close to him lose that passion and connection to understand. Passion is necessary. He begins to feel bad that he taught Taichi to separate himself from his feelings teaching him to let go of anything he may hold dear because emotions are what halt you. It takes bringing Taichi under his wing to realize that almost everything he believes may be a farce. He sees himself in Taichi, so he thought that having him practice the exact same way he does will help him improve. What he didn't know is that Taichi had an influence on him at the same time. Suo witnessed that determination up close, and he saw that they were much more similar than he originally thought. They were both two scared people that feared losing their connection to Karata and hid that fear under detachment. After Taichi's loss to Arata in the Meijin qualifiers, Taichi also comes to understand this about Suo, that he's much more passionate about Karata than anyone gives him credit for. If he wasn't in love with Karata, why would he keep playing? If he wasn't in love with Karata, why would he go out of his way to record every single reader? What Suo really needed was to play against someone who is a passionate Karata monster, someone like Arata who eats Karata for breakfast. Which is why Taichi can't be the one to challenge him in the Meijin match. It has to be Arata. It has to be the person who instilled the passion for Karata inside of Chihaya and whose drive for victory could never be broken. Arata is able to push Suo to that limit, forcing him to admit that he does have a passion for Karata just as much as anyone else who he's played. Finally, putting all of his effort to play against Arata fair and square. Suo finally acknowledges his own weakness and his own fear of isolation from Karata. He never had to push away the sport that he resonated with so deeply. All he had to do was continue to reach out to the cards. Continue to connect to the poems that reverberate so brightly from his ears to his fingertips. He has to accept that his eyesight is going, but that won't be the end for him, and that won't be the end for what he loves. Every character in the series gets tested on how strong their connections are to Karata. We see each one try and fail in matches and in life. A personal setback makes a character step back and look at themselves and reevaluate what's important. This happens time and time again to everyone from the main cast to the supporting characters. They question what keeps them connected to the sport of Karata. What is keeping them from continuing on this laborious path? 
Is it passion for the sport? Or perhaps it's the friends who just make them enjoy their time when they play. There is no wrong answer as long as they continue to reach their hand out when the reader starts the next poem. In the end, Arata's strongest connection and reason to reach out is his grandpa. The one who gave him his passion for Karata. The one who ignited the fire inside of him all of those years ago. The person he sees under the bright red of Omi Jingu in his time of need. Who pushed him to be where he is today. Sitting right in front of the current Meijin, fighting for that same chance to stand where his grandpa once stood. No matter what anyone else tells him, he continues to play Karata to honor his grandpa. He wants to show every everyone what he was passed down. Maybe he isn't the exact same person, but he has the same heart and dedication. It wasn't just the skill for the game that was passed down, but the passion as well. His reason for playing doesn't have to solely be about going back to those childhood days of Team Chihaya Furu. He doesn't have to focus on the past anymore. Those days are precious to him, and they will be for a lifetime. However, he has to leave that room in the rundown apartment. There's no form of Karata where the cards are set out behind you. You have to reach forward. Arata can look to the future and begin new connections that he forged on his own. Ones he made in Fukui, his hometown. Connections with his own team he created, the Nagumo Society, and his family who all cared for his grandpa together. All these connections helped him take the Meijin title for himself in his last year of high school. Becoming the youngest Karata Meijin in history. But Arata didn't get to where he was on his own. He could have practiced every day alone like Shinobu did, but he realized the importance of new connections. Otherwise, he would stay the same forever. Someone who was scared of Karata because of what it symbolized for him. Meeting his mentor and rival Murao once again gave him insight into his own weaknesses. When he formed his Karata team, they gave him the opportunity to grow emotionally. He was able to understand how much skill Team Karata takes too, finally coming to understand how talented Taichi really was. Chihaya and Taichi will always be important to him, and they will always be the two people who made Karata so fun. They're the ones constantly giving him a push from behind to try new things. Both of them made him realize that passion needs to include joy as well. The ones who helped him grow, though, those were the people who he trained and connected with every day in Fukui. Arata will always have his two childhood friends, but he also has new connections of his own. They weren't given to him. He reached out for them with his own personal growth in mind. While Arata had to find those emotional connections himself, Taichi had to find his passion for Karata himself. He needed to find the reason why he kept playing the game. At first, it was to be acknowledged by his two friends. To make Arata accept that he's no longer a coward and to make Chihaya truly look at him for the first time. But both of these have already come to pass. Arata even sees him as a real rival now. One who Taichi beat in a match during the Meijin qualifiers, which was a culmination of all of his efforts up to that point. However, that win doesn't satisfy him as much as he hoped. Karata has become dear to him. Taichi can no longer be satisfied with just having his friend acknowledge him. He's always been too scared to allow himself to feel passion for something that his friends are better than him at. Now though, now he can start playing Karata for himself. He can play Karata because he loves it, and he can beat his friends for himself. Taichi cries when he loses because he loves the game. He gets bitter when he loses because he loves the game. He practices swings even when his friends go on to compete without him because he loves the game. Harada placed a curse on him to try his whole youth to get stronger. A curse that became a blessing. A curse that helped him accept himself. His strongest connection, though, was Chihaya. It had always been Chihaya. She was his pull back into the Karata world. Had he never seen her play in that Class A Karata tournament, having fun and smiling, he may never have felt that spark ignite. Starting a team together, practicing together, betting their youths on getting stronger. He found his friends, his teacher, and his passion through her. His love for Karata would have never bloomed to where it was by the end of the manga 
if it weren't for his love for Chihaya. The Chiha card was one he had only lost once to Koishikawa, who embodied everything that Taichi was striving to be. Even with this loss, his hand could always reach out to instinctually grab it. It was a card that helped him win his Class A match, his Meijin qualifier match, and a match against Arata. The love for Chihaya is what always brought him out of that detachment towards Karata. It's what made him realize that he can't actually feel nothing for this game or her. At every step of the way, Chihaya was there to witness his determination and gave him that courage to keep moving forward. Her presence made him nervous, but it also gave him a kind of strength that he could never have when playing Karta on his own. For Chihaya, she's greedy. She's never been someone who could only reach for one thing. She wants what she wants and she'll get it no matter how much hard work she has to put in. Her connection to the Mizusawa team is where she pulls her inner strength. She plays her best Karata when she sits on the tatami as the captain with her friends around her. The lessons she learned from her friends were ones that are invaluable that she'll carry for the rest of her life. She learned that there was no one hard and fast way to play Karata. Passion can't get her everywhere if she doesn't train her weaknesses or learn new skills. She does strategy like Sutomu taught her, and drinks water between matches like Namita taught her. Her connections to the Mizusawa team brings her closer to connecting to the cards thanks to Kana. The cards become dear to Chihaya, not just because of their meanings, but because of the people that they represent as well. Each card was given to her by someone else. The A cards were given to her by her Kohai Sukuba. The Tago card was given to her by Kana and the Tare and Tachi poem were given to her by Taichi. Each has significance to those she loves in different ways. Whether it be a character's favorite card that grew to have meaning to her as well, or a card of their namesake. These poems are now a part of Chihaya because those around her are a part of her. During her fifth match against Shinobu for the title of Queen, Every card that Chihaya wins has significance to her in some way. They all represent her friends she made in that club room. As she imagines herself playing against Shinobu in the Mizusawa practice room, she plays her strongest karta against someone she once thought to be unbeatable. Chihaya plays her best when she's around those that she cares for and those who supported her and uplifted her in return. Until ultimately, the last card is read. Tachi, a poem about parting, about pining for someone who you've lost and you'll always reach towards no matter what. A card Chihaya must win no matter what, and she does. Hands reaching out is a large focus in Chihaya Furu, partially because the series is about a game using hands However, the use of these hands plays up the idea of connection. The need to connect to the cards in front of you to see your dreams come to life. The need to connect to a singular card in front of you because it symbolizes much more than just a battle of speed. Reaching out towards the intonation of the reader and grabbing the sounds out of their mouth before they make them. Connecting in mind, body, and soul to reach your hand out and take what's important in front of you. Whether it be a card, a poem, or a hand. Karata is powerful. It has given so much to Chihaya in every facet of her life. It brought her out of the loneliness she once felt. Reconnecting her with the person who gave her that passion, as well as the person who supported her emotionally. She found friends and rivals who would never let her play in an empty room again. Mentors who wanted to see her grow while also challenging her along the way. Harada told Chihaya that Karata is like making 100 friends. And for Chihaya, that's exactly what it is. The power of connection can be something we take for granted if we don't stop to see who got us to where we are today. Of course, the work effort comes from ourselves, but there's always someone who motivates us to move forward. It could be a teacher, a friend, a partner, or a family member. Someone that is the reason for what you love or the driving force behind your passion. Whether it's to be acknowledged for who you are, a need to prove yourself, or simply just sharing what was once given to you. In a lot of ways, my journey of watching and reading Chihaya Furu is similar to that of Chihaya's journey with Karata. I found the series through a friend who loved it just as much as I do now, 
And because of that love, I want to share this series with as many other people as I can. I want more people to know about the great themes and characters and how deeply it affected me. Just like how Arata wanted to share his love of Karata with Chihaya, and she wanted to share her joy of Karata with others.